Hey everyone, welcome to my channel, my name is Yari and this is a channel about freelance photo and video production. At some point of our lives, each of us faces a situation when we have to upgrade the equipment that we have since it cannot handle the tasks that we are getting anymore. So we have to think carefully about what equipment should we get since upgrading in our industry isn't cheap. And that remains one of the most important questions. Should we save some amount and get something that will be sufficient for another year or two? Or should we spend a fortune and get something that will last for many years to come? Personally, I think that you can save some money by purchasing some gimbals, light, audio, some other equipment from the third party that will offer the same level of quality or similar level of quality for the lower price. But when it comes to cameras, it's better to spend some extra money and get the tool which will not be limiting your creativity or ruining your workflow. Uh, that's why whenever Sony 73 came out, I told to myself, oh, f it, this shit is expensive, but I'm gonna get it no matter what. And here I am, more than one year later, and only now I started opening the true camera potential step by step. Since then I changed uh, several lenses, some other equipment, but not even once I got a thought about changing my camera, because until now it wasn't the camera that was limiting my creativity, but it was my skills that were limiting the camera abilities. The true potential of Sony a7S III is insane, and it just feels good using it for my daily tasks. But enough of these empty talks, let's speak about a few things that I really love about this camera and about few moments that are still kind of bothering me after one year of using it. And would I choose differently if I would have to make this decision now? Uh, that's gonna be a quite a long but informative and interesting talk, so make yourself a cup of coffee or tea and let's get into it. <laughs> Normally in these kind of reviews you start from the good things and then you talk about some bad things to balance them out, but this time I would like to do the opposite way. Please consider that I'm kind of nitpicking here just because I truly consider and believe that this camera is one of the best on the market at the moment, but still I need to point them out. First of all, Sony A7S III is a 12 megapixels camera, which is absolutely perfect for me as for the videographer, but as for the photographer it has some own limitations. Well, don't get me wrong, in many cases 12 megapixels is more than enough for the photography as well, but nowadays competition is really strong and when it comes to some kind of product shoots or for the fashion photography, no one is gonna take you serious in a case if your camera has a 12 megapixel matrix. This kind of shows sometimes getting printed on the billboards or in the fashion magazines and often they require some cropping and 12 megapixels are not really good at that. But when it comes to personal photo shoots, 12 megapixels are more than enough. In fact, people look better on 12 megapixels than on 48 megapixels. Since 12 megapixels are more than enough to keep the photos detailed but hide some imperfections, and still, sometimes in Lightroom I have to reduce the clarity to hide imperfections even more. These photos can easily be published online or even printed up to A3 size, so it's not really a problem, it's just something you have to consider. If your main goal is a product shot, so maybe the photo shootings for the high-end magazines, then better consider a7 IV or a7 R4 or even Canon R5 or R6, they will give you better details. There is no active stabilization in 100 or 120 fps. That's not really an issue since after slowing down the footage you cannot really see these micro shakes. Besides that, uh, sometimes during the active camera movement the active stabilization can screw up your image badly. But still there were a few cases where I missed this feature. It's not a deal breaker though, because anyway I'm using my camera mostly on my gimbal. You can't record proxy files with your main footage in a case if you shoot in 100 or 120 fps. And this footage is really heavy, it may smoke any of the powerful systems nowadays. But still you can make proxy files manually during the post-production. By the way, if you are not familiar with proxy files, how to make them, how to work with them and why do you need them, please let me know down in the comment section below, I'll make a separate video for you. Flip out screen is not the best one on the market. I mean, it's good enough to get the job done, but sometimes you may struggle trying to figure out some small details on the screen. Canon R5 has a bigger screen which is easier to read and I'm not even talking about the Blackmagic cameras with a huge gorgeous screen, which doesn't flip out though. 
On a series productions, most probably you'll be using an external screen anyway, but when it comes to some efficient run and gun shooting, sometimes you just don't have such an opportunity. 4K in 10 bit with a 422 color sampling is really heavy on your computer especially when it comes to higher frame rates. I mean, that's not a technical issue, but it's something you have to consider that in the case if you are planning to work with these kind of materials, you have to own a hell of a machine. Or you can always create proxies, but it's an extra step in your workflow which requires more efforts and time. All right, I think we're done with the cons of this camera. And once again, I would like to remind you that none of the listed above is a deal breaker. It's just something you have to consider before departures. Now let's talk about the pros of Sony a7 III and oh my, we have a lot to talk about. I'll try to be brief, but no promises. Image quality. I don't even know where to start since it's the most important selling point of this camera. It's just perfect. Crystal clear image with a bitrate up to 200 megabits per second, 10 bit color depth and up to 16 bit row in the case if you are shooting for the external storage. Color correction and grading of the footage from this camera is a pure pleasure and Sony claims up to 15 stops of the dynamic range. Well, in reality it's about 13 stops of usable dynamic range both in S-Log3 and HLG. That's really a result that before was achievable only in cinema level cameras like Canon C500 Mark II or Mark III. Well, for example, Sony a7 III got about 11.3 stops of dynamic range and Blackmagic has about 11.1 stops of dynamic range which is usable, uh, I'm not talking about the top limits. Same comes to Canon R5. If we're talking about Canon A7 IV, which was released not so long ago, it has as well a, an amazing dynamic range, which is almost the same as this camera has, and maybe sometimes it even shows a better result. So that means that with this camera, you can achieve a really cinematic image if you use it properly. Reliability of the Sony a7 III is insane. I'm living in Dubai and probably most of you know how the weather here can be, especially during the summertime. Well, a few days ago I was shooting by the beach at 43 degrees Celsius and the humidity was 74%. That's a hostile environment for your equipment. You have to let your camera rest outside your bag for another 10-15 minutes before you start shooting. Otherwise, your lens immediately gets covered with a condensate and you cannot really wipe it, you cannot do anything, you have to wait anyway. <laughs> and after another 10 minutes, all of your equipment starts overheating. But not Sony a7 III. For about half a year, I've been working with a sport company and I've been shooting for them twice a week in a similar weather conditions. And Sony a7 III never overheated on me even once. Obviously, it can get quite hot on touch if you shoot in such a conditions, but nothing you or your camera cannot handle. As well, quite cool that you don't have to keep in your head this 30 minutes limitation of shooting time as you do have in many other cases. 120 FPS, 10 bit at the bitrate of 200 megabits per second. Do I have to add something else? That's one of the most high-end slow motion footage you may get up to day with a mirrorless or DSLR cameras. It's absolutely gorgeous and will definitely add some extra wow effect to your videos. And if you shoot a lot of dynamic scenes, that's absolutely must-have feature in your camera. Also, if you shoot with a similar slow motion settings on every cameras, most of the cases you will get the crop uh, about 1.3, one and a half times. In the case of Sony a7 III, you're getting the crop which is 1.1 times. That means if you shoot with this camera at 50 millimeters lens, you will get about 55 millimeters of a real focal length. Well, if you'll be shooting with other cameras, you'll be getting about 70, 75 millimeters of actual focal length. Wide choice of excellent color profiles. Each of them find its use in a real life scenarios. In a case if you're shooting in a controlled environment and you would like to get the most juicy, contrasty, popping image right out of your camera, you can go for the PP off, which is a normal color profile. You will get an absolutely beautiful picture. If you want to get the widest dynamic range, the most cinematic look, and the biggest flexibility on the post production, go for the S Log 3. If you don't want to spend the whole day grading, but still you want to get this wide dynamic range, go for HLG. And let's say if you shoot an interview and you would like to get a soft image with uh, skin flattering colors, uh, go for the S Cineton, the PP11, which was added with a firmware update 2.0. As you can see, there is something for each purpose and scenario. 
Well, to be completely honest with you, up to not too long ago, I've been shooting most of my projects in S Cinetone PP11, uh, which allowed me to get more dynamic range and more cinematic image than at a normal mode, but same time, which is much easier to grade than uh, S-Log3. However, not too long ago, I decided to sharpen my skills and jump to log profile, and I was surprised how much I was missing by avoiding it for such a long time. Keep in mind that shooting at log profile requires from you some knowledge about how to expose and control your image properly. Uh, yet again, if you don't know how to expose properly the log profile or how to correct and grade it, please let me know down in the comments below and I'll make a video for you. Let me tell you one secret why I stopped shooting S-Log3 back in the days. First of all, it happened because I took one project and I screwed it up badly exactly because I didn't know how to work with it properly. So since then I was quite scared to use it. But now I realize that in any case, if you really know how to work with it, it's absolutely out of any competition. One of the really important things that I cannot avoid mentioning is the net performance of this camera. Probably you already know that Sony a7 III holds the title of a low-light king, and trust me, there are some really good reasons for that. Even though Sony never told anything about that, but apparently it has a double native ISO, which really depends on the color profile you shoot at it. If you shoot in a linear color space, which is basically everything beside PP7 or PP8, which are low color spaces, uh, then you got a first native ISO at 100, and then the second one kicks in at 1600s. And it manages the noise level very well up to ISO about 6400s. However, if you shoot in a log profile, which is exactly PP7 or PP8, then the base native ISO becomes 640 and it goes on up to about 1600 then it starts degrading and on and on and on up to 10k it becomes really almost unusable but then when you switch to 12800 it becomes crystal clear once again what a magic and then it magically remains clear up to ISO about 40,000 and still if you want to go crazy you can jump to 102,000 and image is kind of still usable. At that point, it's not a camera anymore, it's a night viewing device. But even if that is not enough for you, you can go berserk and raise your ISO up to 409,000 ISO, revealing black holes at the furthest corners of the universe. But always remember, with the great strength come a great responsibility. I mean, with the high ISO comes a large amount of noise. If that is not impressive, I don't know what else is. Let's talk about autofocus. There is not so much to tell about it, but it's just brilliant. Before the Sony a7 III, I wouldn't dare to shoot with autofocus on aperture 2.8 or wider. Nowadays, I almost always shoot at 1.4 aperture and I am always sure that the focus will be where it needs to be. Even like right now, you can just check this out. I don't know, maybe accidentally it will drop out right now at the moment and I will be like, damn, I lied to you guys, but I doubt that. And with the latest 2.10 firmware update, Sony improved their eye focusing even further. By the way, if you are not sure how to update the firmware at your camera, I'll leave a link for you down in the description to this video. I mean, don't expect the autofocus to be absolutely perfect. It's still a machine and sometimes it can focus on a wrong object or the focus can just miss, but it happens so rarely that very quick you will get used to trust your camera AF completely. One of the only cases where I switch to manual focusing is if I'm shooting some dynamic close-ups because in this case camera is not sure where it needs to be focusing, so you can see some focus breathing. Before we wrap up this video, let me quickly mention as well almost absent rolling shutter effect. It is very important for me since I often shoot in a very fast-paced environment and I don't want to see any jelly effect on my video. In fact, I consider that Sony a7 III is one of the best at rolling shutter reading department. All right, I can go on and go on and go on and talk about things which I love about this camera because there are plenty of things to love about, but I just don't want to take too much of your time, so I'll keep this list short. This camera costs a lot. Three and a half thousand dollars is not the amount that you always carry in your pocket just in case, so it really depends what you are comparing it with. If you need some simple mirrorless camera which may offer some decent options for the photo and video production, you may check some cheaper options. In this case, have a look at Sony a7 IV or Sony a7 III even, since it's really decent option of the day. 
However, if you need a cinema level camera that may be used for both photo and video production, you will not really find a competition here. In fact, Sony A7 III established its own category, which is really difficult to get into. If you're still considering buying it, I'll leave for you a link in the video description below. Thank you so much for watching this video. Don't forget to leave a thumbs up in the case if you liked it and subscribe if you loved it. Also, click this bell button in the case if you would like to get notified whenever I publish the next one. Also, feel free to share your thoughts about this video or the camera in the comment section down below. I'm always glad to connect. See you in the next one. Bye.